thank you everybody for uh, for coming today and uh, navigating the traffic. And uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce this session on engaging models of civic engagement in the sciences uh, for this year's Community Engaged Partner, uh, Partnership Symposium. Uh, I am Alan Christian. I'm a, a Center Leadership Fellow, which I'll explain uh, a little bit later. I'm the Director of the Environmental Studies Program in the School for the Environment. And my home department is in the Biology Department in the College of Science and Math. And I'm going to give a uh, about 10 minute overview, kind of linking uh, different components together in, in setting up uh, our, our guest speakers that have ventured from, from Worcester today. Um, <clears throat> in the context of this at the, uh, at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, civic engagement and social responsibility is part of our, our university mission. As we can see uh, here, I'm not going to go over in word by word on that, but it, uh, both of those in there are part of the university mission and our liberal arts education philosophy. We can see some of the standards uh, set by the LEAP. In here we have uh, of one of the four or five main learning outcomes is personal and social responsibility, civic knowledge and engagement at the, both the local and environmental level. So that's a context that we have and the philosophy we have on campus and an important part of our mission. To, fur to further that, civic engagement uh, and environmental stewardship and sustainability are two of the university's seven core values. And again, I'm not going to go into stating them. Um, from my perspective, the uh, environmental uh, component is very important because I'm an environmental scientist. Um, and this doesn't, uh, engagement is another uh, important part. Community partnerships was a, it was a core uh, unit on campus that facilitates that. And environmental stewardship and sustainability, I talk to, when I talk to people about some of the unique aspects of the university is, well, we have these departments, environmental studies department, school for the environment. There's actually pockets of environmental expert in just about every department on campus. And when you tie those two together, um, you have uh, a capacity in the university in terms of uh, engagement uh, and environment. And I should expand this as it's expected in all scholarship or part of the mission that all scholarship engages uh, to some level in, in, um, in, in, with the communities. In terms of relating this to how science is, sometimes people say, well, how does science in, in civic engagement work? Is, as we know, this is kind of the age of technology in science. Um, our so society, nation, and global community needs science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, otherwise known as STEM, to understand and address important problems and questions of our time. Within that context, uh, individuals, communities, and, and countries are under-equipped for scientific knowledge. Science and technology is moving so fast that we're, we're, we're lagging behind in our full understanding. Everything's out on the internet, it's being put out there, and do we have time to digest and really understand what it means? With that say, said, when we think about non-majors at, uh, uh, at institutions, Non-majors may have, are required through distribution courses to take one non-majors natural science course. Is, and that might be in a very focused area. Um, but they don't require any more STEM. And so in terms of the liberal arts kind of perspective, in terms of being a, uh, socially and civically responsible, is that enough to make decisions back at their, in their communities? And then overall, we keep on saying it, there's still, in the terms of the workforce, we, we're, we're still lacking um, the workforce for, uh, for majors in these STEM fields. <clears throat> With that said, there are some national initiatives that um, link civic engagement and responsibility and science. And one of those was an NSF-funded program uh, in, uh, the National Center for Science and Civic Engagement, in which has a mission to inspire, support, dissemin and disseminate campus-based science education 
reform strategies that strengthen learning and build civic accountability among students in colleges and universities. And so that was a, an entity and a, a big an initiative. Within uh, NCS, well, missed a, a C here, uh, NCSCE, there are different initiatives. And I'll be talking about one that I've been involved in called Censor, Science Education for New Civic Engagements and Responsibilities. But within this uh, initiative, there are, or within this entity, there are all kinds of initiatives that relate back to civic engagement, STEM, and STEM education. And one of the big aspects of this is the center uh, serves as a resource for the improvement of undergraduate science education and it provides a platform enabling faculty and administrators to broaden the impact uh, of in innovation and reforms beyond their campuses. So, so it becomes, some people become the innovators and this is a mechanism also then to um, disseminate that and make it available to others to implement on in their campuses. <coughs> in terms of my perspective from this and uh, the guest speakers involved with uh, Sensor, the, again, that's the, one of the initiatives, is science uh, education for new uh, civic engagement and respons uh, engagements and responsibilities. And under this unit, Sensor has a lot of initiatives itself. Uh, they sponsor symposium. There's an annual summer institute that's put on every summer that has um, limit, limited, but a fair number, I can't remember how many participants, two, three hundred uh, participants. Usually it comes in groups of administrators, faculty, and students that are involved. There's also the, uh, the Capitol Hill uh, Symposium that's uh, put on every year. And one of the more late, recent initiatives are development of uh, regional centers because not everybody can make the, the symposium in the summer in the institute. Uh, and those individual uh, grou um, centers are put on their own s um, seminars and symposia. And I think next week is the New England one. Next weekend is the New England one. There's fellowships and awards that, are, that they have. Uh, under that, I applied and, or got nominated and applied uh, for a Censor Leadership Fellow. The idea is, again, there's only so many people can make a meeting or maybe you can't make an annual meeting, but the idea is that one individual can make some changes on campus and use the sensor principles to do that. There's the regional centers we see across here that were developed. Again, they are a resource um, that for uh, the sensor principles and we're utilizing that today uh, from the folks uh, in the New England chapter. Resources, there's uh, sensor modules. So people have developed different sensor models in terms of including civic engagement and science and integrating those that can be used uh, by instructors and professors at institutions. Uh, there's backgrounders, uh, small readings on a particular topic that can uh, start people in terms of including STEM and civic engagement. Publications that are uh, derived from sensor products. They actually have a, a sensor international journal and house calls, and that's part of what the regional uh, groups do. Come on and uh, come to a campus and, and work with faculty. Assessment in, uh, in terms of uh, assessing sensor principles and, and use, also just in terms of assessment uh, used in classrooms. So there's uh, sensor results showing the effectiveness of, of this uh, aspect of civic engagement, responsibility, and learning STEM. Formative evaluations, initiatives uh, that include uh, Committee on Assessment, and Student Achievement, Scholarship of Teaching, and tools. Sensor SALG, I use it in just about every, uh, every one of my courses. It's a phenomenal tool. I use it, the SALG, the base is student assessment and learning gains. I use the SALG in, my in my, all of my classes and even in my research programs. And then there's sensor SALG that has the aspect of incorporating civic engagement and how that impacted 
student learning uh, in the classroom using sensor principles. Uh, learning goals, uh, different rubrics, and if you go to the uh, Summer Institute, you can actually get a small grant from Sensor and actually for implementation of a particular um, Sensor principle on your own campus. So there's lots of different resources that are available for it. <coughs> I wanted to say in terms of this, this has profoundly changed how I approach the classroom, uh, how I approach my, and beyond that, it's even changed how I approach my research and my service. And so, Sensor is not only just about civic engagement uh, in related to STEM, but it also, uh, um, there, when you go to the Summer Institute, there's workshops and seminars on pedagogy, best, best practices in the classroom. I learned, uh, also learned a lot about assessment and, and different types of assessment and using that to find out what do students know, what worked, didn't work. That profoundly changed how I went about my teaching. In my classroom, I integrated all of these. I implemented civic engagement to my nine majors uh, STEM courses. Drastically changed on how students kind of looked at the, the, uh, the, day, the uh, subject matter they were looking at. They just didn't say, how does this relate to me any longer? Uh, they were able to see, oh wow, this it could affect, I could use this knowledge in my local community. I even included in my majors course as a component uh, internships and capsto uh, cooperatives, so that was one of my big initiatives, is um, working with local non-government organizations and having the students not only do research but then be part of the stakeholder meetings or the different meetings for these guys and provide the science and also in some of the decision making for these local organizations. So it's really powerful. And then of course capstone courses at the, at the end, so you have the bookend. Uh, your intro class is your capstone. Initiated, uh, initiated in the School for the Environment capstone in which civic engagement was a part of that process. Um, it wasn't just uh, about STEM science it, uh, or science and technology. It was how does this relate to the local uh, organizations or a local environmental problem. And then, as I uh, said, my research for example, in working with the Charles River Watershed Association, incorporated undergraduate and graduate research. Um, they helped in developing a biomonitoring program in citizen science. In that, now Charles River Watershed can take this and do citizen science where they couldn't because uh, they, they can know more about their watershed because the state's on a five to 10 year rotation about monitoring water quality. Now Charles River can do this annually. Waltham Land Trust Hardy Pond, they had some fish kills in the pond uh, there. They wanted to know why. So we have undergraduates that are doing research there. They write a report and some recommendations and go to board meetings and report on their findings. And uh, one of our, my big initiatives is Tidmarsh Farms Cranberry Bog Restoration. This is a huge uh, collaboration. Uh, all kinds of stakeholders have undergraduate and graduate research and ultimately they want to take this cranberry farm, 240 acres, and the landowner wants to make a living observatory and go through how this system was restored and know the science and technology and you have the community engagement because they want to bring people online, a virtual experience, and an in-person. And so they have sen sen sensors in the sense of sensing the environment, not sensor the, the entity. And then service, all part of this goes into part of my service aspect. So it's profoundly changed the way I go about my business. So this links together with this meeting today um, and the initiatives on campus, the offices for community partnerships and faculty development, uh, and the civic engagement scholars initiative, SESI, have provided opportunities to expand and enhance my civic engagement activities and build those networks. Uh, and it takes a while to build local networks and so uh, it's really good resources. I'm in SESI in the third, in the, what they call SESI 3 in the th third cohort. It provides resource and training for UMB faculties and uh, partners to come up with your plan, initiate, uh, to implement it and then to report on it. 
And then office community partnerships, one of the aspects is today's symposium, um, which leads us into our, our uh, guest speakers today, uh, engaging models of civic engagement uh, in the sciences. Um, on the interactive qualita qualita qualified project and great problem seminar. All right, and so just to wrap everything up, hopefully I've painted the picture in terms of our UMass Boston's community and national initiatives is that uh, social responsibility and civic engagement. We have here locally, we have SESI, Office of Community Engagement, Faculty Development, in terms of linking here, uh, Sensor and CSE. All these things are going on and there's qu quite an overlap. We want to make that linkages because sometimes science gets lost in kind of this idea of, of community engagement and how does science fit in. So here I am uh, introducing um, the two topics today are uh, two models of how to incorporate in civic engagement uh, in STEM uh, from uh, Worcester Polytechnic uh, Institute Great Problem Seminar, uh, two course introduction and university level research project focusing on themes of current global importance. Everything you'll see, everything is tied to current events, social, societal problems and human needs. And then the other project is the interactive quality uh, uh, qualifying project, the nine credit interdisciplinary requirement involving applied research connecting to science and technology with social issues and human needs. So two kind of different, not quite two extreme uh, uh, spectrums because uh, it, uh, it's not just a one semester course. So I had inf uh, information, there was only two speakers, but we even got some more exciting. We got the two uh, faculty members and, two, and three outstanding students that uh, we'll be introducing, um, uh, or we'll be talking today. And I do have a, a background on each of you. Uh, so, uh, Corey Denberg Daner works, works uh, is an assistant teaching professor in interdisciplinary and global studies division at uh, WPI and director of the Worcester Community Project Center. A public interest lawyer in your previous life, uh, Corey practiced law as an assistant general counsel for the community builders and clerked for the justices of the Massachusetts Supreme Court. Earned, uh, she earned a degree, Juris Doctorate from Boston College Law School with a specialization in environmental law and her PhD from Northeastern University in Law and Public Policy. Uh, Corey has worked with new, numerous government and uh, nonprofit organizations developing drink, drinking water, environmental justice, and dam removal policies. Um, that's Tidmarsh Farms, dam removal. Uh, prior to coming to, uh, going to, uh, being at WPI, you taught, uh, she taught at Boston College, Northeastern University, and Suffolk University. Uh, then our other faculty is Kristen Wooby. Wobie, no, sorry. It's I, impossible. <laughs> an associate dean for undergraduate studies at uh, WPI, uh, is a member of the w WPI faculty in the chemistry and biochemistry department, uh, head of chemistry and biochemistry from 2007 to 2011, associate dean uh, for the first year uh, for 2009 to 2011. Is that like a freshman seminar? Uh, among, among other responsibilities, uh, Chris is currently directs in our, uh, the innovative interdisciplinary project-based first year seminar program, Great Problem Seminars, uh, which has been featured in the International Educator and the New York Times. Um, we're going to tell you a little bit about WPI and its background because WPI is actually um, not your standard science and engineering school. Um, we are a science and engineering school. Almost all of our majors um, graduate with uh, a STEM degree of one. It's on the desktop, I think. Yes. That's the one. 
So one of the, the issues that we face with our students um, is that they all come very excited to take their science and engineering classes, but maybe not so excited when they have to take their distribution requirements in the humanities and arts and social sciences. Um, so we, we find that these kinds of project opportunities work really well from both directions, helping the science students see the value in the non-science related courses and helping the non-science related students see the value in their science related courses. Um, and so for this work, workshop or the presentation today, we have a couple of different things we hope that um, you get out of it. We're going to talk about what we see are the uh, necessary components of what we call collaborative community-based research projects and talk about how we do that at WPI because we do it in a lot of different ways <coughs> and then hopefully give you some ideas that you can take back and use in your own courses or at your own institutions to um, infuse more community-based research projects into your curriculum and classes. So, <coughs> but before we do that, because project-based learning, um, it, it's out there. Everybody has have heard of it, but there are a lot of different ideas about what, in fact, it actually entails. So we thought we'd give you our definition. Um, so at WPI, when we're talking about community-based research or problem-based research, um, we're talking about open-ended problems, things that ha don't have a single answer. Um, they're usually real. Real problems are messy. They don't connect to just one discipline, so you have to be considering lots of different perspectives. Um, they usually require some kind of integration and synthesis of material from a variety of courses or real life experiences. And at WPI, we try to make sure that the goals, methods, and criteria that are chosen to try and solve the problem are chosen by the students with lots of guidance from the, their faculty support and, and other classmates, but that they have a real vested interest in figuring out not only what, what the solution is going to be, but how they're going to get to it and what they need to do to do that. Um, so that's our, our view of what problem-based learning and, and a lot of collaborative research problem solving is. And now I just want to tell you a little bit about WPI. Forty years ago, WPI was a very traditional, very rigorous engineering and science school, but heavy emphasis on the engineering, much less on the science. Students came, it was one of those look to the left, look to the right, at the end of this first year, one of you isn't going to be here, you know, forced march through the curriculum. And there was a dean who was pretty forward looking and said, you know, don't like that, it's not working. We need to do something different. And so a group of faculty worked for quite some time and came up with a whole new idea for a curriculum. And the faculty voted on it and it passed. And what it did is it threw out everything, everything, and started with putting projects at the center. So there were required projects to graduate, no required courses. And the two, actually three required projects to graduate were um, in the humanities and arts. Um, all of our students get what is essentially a minor in some area in the humanities and arts. And the requirement there is they have to do a capstone, which is frequently a creative or research intensive project. Um, they, they can direct a play, they can write a score, they can do a research project, but they have to do that. The second one is the one called the Interactive Qualifying Project, which is like one of the most awkward names on the planet because what does that mean exactly? Well, what it means exactly, um, there is no exactly. <laughs> but basically, the students are asked to deal with, in nine credit hours or one quarter of their work that year, some problem that's at the intersection of science, technology, and society, human need. And, and the intent was that this would help the students see that their careers as engineers and scientists had, were influenced by <coughs> what was going on in society and that what they did would similarly influence what was going on in society. 
Um, and so that was, that's, that's probably our most unique um, curricular component at this point. And the third project was essentially a senior thesis. So all of our students are required to do a nine credit hour major qualifying project or senior thesis. Again, it's a quarter of the time they spend in their senior year, um, and that's a capstone in their major. So primarily research for the engineers, it's, it's design, sometimes a design um, project. But so that was the three projects, and then the courses were sort of built around that. And we've gotten rid of a lot of the other things that were really new and different then, but the project focus has, has really stayed. And because of those projects, what we've seen over the 40 years since this was implemented, that project work sneaks into classes all the time. Um, we've really come to recognize that some of the best learning that happens happens through project work, through working with teams, um, on something that takes what is going on in the course content and makes it real. So there's lots of projects in courses. And then the most recent addition to the curriculum, a little less than 10 years ago, we were looking at results of the National Student Survey of Student Engagement and other, and hearing from our students. They come to WPI because they really want to do these projects. They're very excited. We, we advertise it heavily to incoming students. They come, they want to do projects, and they were being told, no, no projects your first year. You, you don't know enough yet. You need to learn the basic stuff. And we decided maybe that really wasn't true. And so we instituted um, a program called the Great Problem Seminars, which are courses. It's a, the equivalent of two courses taught over a semester which at WPI, that's kind of a different thing. WPI has the most unusual academic calendar in the planet in which we have academic terms that last seven weeks. And there are four of them in an academic year. However, these courses are a full semester. Um, and the, the deal with, and they involve a project. So now we've got a project opportunity. This is not required. These three are still required of all our students. The first year one is not required of all our students, but we're thinking that maybe we should go there. So um, I'll be talking about the Great Problem Seminars. Um, I've got a couple of my students who are in Great Problem Seminars, and they'll talk to you a little bit about their project experience. And then Corey's going to pick up with the IQP and tell you a little more about that. And of course, has a student who will do that. So there, those are the two we're focusing on. So the Great Problem Seminars. Um, we have a, a suite of them, and it sort of can change from year to year what is being offered. But each of them has at its focus one of the world's big problems. And there's certainly plenty of them. So it's kind of nice because it gives faculty and students choices. You know, what do they want to spend their time on? The courses are all co-taught, and we very um, intentionally always pair faculty so we have a scientist or an engineer paired with somebody from a humanistic discipline. So I teach the food sustainability class, I'm a biochemist, my partner is in the humanities. Um, we have a water class where we have an environmental engineer paired with um, someone from the School of Business that does leadership and organizational behavior. So we have the technical humanist pairings and, and we find that to be really important to the effectiveness of the courses. The learning outcomes, as you might guess, don't focus a lot on content. So in the food sustainability class, we talk about the biochemistry of some of the micronutrients, and we talk about um, the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle in, in agriculture, but we don't talk a lot about those. That's not the focus of the course. Um, we really much more work on a lot of skill development. And each of you, there's a handout there, and the learning outcomes for the Great Problem Seminar are on it. But it's a lot about learning how to give presentations, learning how to do research, um, learning how to ask good questions that, have, that you can answer, um, problem solving, critical thinking, library research, et cetera. Um, and because that's what we are aiming for in these courses, the structure allows the faculty and the students to do a really good look at 
a lot of the different facets of the problem. We don't have to teach just the chemistry or just the history of the problem. We get to look at it from those perspectives, certainly, but also cultural, economic. How does government policy affect food? And, you know, for some of our students, they don't think very, they haven't thought about that. And so it's, it's a revelation to some of them how much government policy controls what we see. Um, so that makes it kind of fun, too. So how do the courses work? The first half, our first term, um, we, the two faculty and the 60 students, because each of these is capped at 60, so it's kind of a big class for what you would think of as a seminar, um, look at, those, at the big problem from those various perspectives. We do look at food from an economic, from an agricultural, from a demographic, political, as well as the technical and biochemical aspects. Um, we make the students work pretty hard. I think they would agree that they, they work pretty hard in these courses. There are lots of assignments, and the assignments are all, um, they're very varied in that some are individual, some are group assignments. Most of them are very open-ended. There is not a, a question on there that's got a single right answer most of the time. We send them to databases, we send them to grocery stores, we send them um, to the library. So they have to do a lot of different things. And in the process of doing these assignments, they're giving presentations and getting quite a bit of practice writing, which is all preparation for the second half. And what they know is happening is that the second half, they're going to divide into teams. So all those group assignments have given them some idea of who they work well with and who maybe they don't work so well with. And then they have to either pick a topic, or in some classes there are a bunch of topic areas already um, decided. That some of these students are, have uh, projects with sponsors. And the topic has to be some small piece of that big problem. So in food sustainability, um, there are a whole bunch of problems. But the students have to sort of narrow it down to a piece that they can propose a solution or two, evaluate them, pick one, decide how it could be implemented, and decide what could be a good assessment plan if they were able to implement the plan. And they have to do all of that in seven weeks as first year students, usually in their first semester of college. Um, so the end, they have a report to produce and a poster. And what you see up there is a picture. We have a giant poster session where all of the great problem seminars do their presentation in the same room at the same time. We have external judges, the president, the provost, the deans, faculty, upper class students come. It's quite a campus event um, and is very empowering of our students. So that's sort of the general structure of the, of the course. Um, and I think the next we're going to have the students talk. Let me make sure. Oh, here's just a few examples, and these are taken from a, a variety of the courses. So you can see that giving the students some choices results in incredibly varied sets of projects. Um, the first time we ran these courses, we were a little nervous because we were coming from that place of, you know, they don't have a lot of the fundamentals. What kind of projects will they be able to do? And after we saw what they could do, we were like, we, we are expecting so little of our first year students. We ought really need to get out of their way and let them do so much more than, than we ask them to. Um, but they come up with a variety of really cool and interesting topics and have some really great ideas. Um, so, and, and a lot of them, you know, they don't have to actually implement these, right? It's seven weeks. It's the first year. They're taking two other classes simultaneous. Um, but for many of these, they have had to go call somebody, an expert. They have had to maybe go somewhere and talk to somebody. They frequently, this one, the students um, developed an uh, informational brochure. It actually was looking specifically at spina bifida rates in New Mexico, which is one of the highest spina bifida rates in the US. And clearly one of the students was from there and maybe had a personal connection. So the team made these informational brochures. The student went back to New Mexico over break and delivered them to a bunch of places where they thought 
um, it might be important for that information to be. So some of the students do pick these up and continue on with them. The most uh, dramatic example of that is there is one team who was working on, uh, this was a sponsored project, one of our faculty members had a connection to a, an NGO that was working in Kenya. And uh, a woman had, uh, who was in, in a village in Kenya wanted to, to uh, make soaps. And a student group developed a business plan for her, how she could do this and, and then dispense the soaps and sell them. And, and it was partnered with another group that was working on a portable water purification system that the NGO had developed and how you would take it to the village and, and situate it so that clean water could be delivered to the entire village in a way that felt fair and equitable. And, and um, the students were so excited by this project. They raised enough money to go to Kenya a year and a half later to, to see what they could do to help it actually come to fruition. Um, so it, not every student can do that. Not every project team does that. Um, but it, it does catch their interest to the point where they, they sometimes do do that. And so now we're going to switch to our two students who just finished their Great Problems Seminar in December. So they're still first year students working on the rest of their curriculum. So um, we are introduced, but just again, I'm Tali and this is Jack. And um, for our project, we knew immediately when we were assigned that we wanted to do something that would make an actual difference. And we thought that we would love to do something to give back to the community because they're really, really supportive of WPI and everything that we do in Worcester. Um, so we did a lot of research. And we came to the conclusion that childhood obesity is still a major problem in the Worcester public school system. And um, we found that 38.8% of students who consume school lunches are obese. So clearly the food that they're being served every day and the nutrition habits that they're being taught at school directly, cor directly correlate to their childhood obesity. Uh, <coughs> so like Tali said, we knew we wanted to do something with childhood obesity. and. We knew that it was directly correlated to school lunches, and we had this great fact that 38.8% of students who ate school lunches were obese, and we just kept doing research, and really, when it came down to it, we decided the best way for us to really, you know, do the best research that we could was to actually visit a school and to observe what their lunch program was. So we emailed and called just about every single middle school, elementary school that we possibly could find. Um, we did get in contact with one particular uh, middle school in the Worcester area, Worcester East Middle School. Um, so we scheduled a visit at date. We, uh, we visited the school, and it was kind of a culture shock when we first walked in. Um, it was clear that they didn't have much money. Um, we'll go more into that later. Um, but So we visited, and while we were walking down to the cafeteria, the vice principal was kind of telling us a little bit about the school and told us that the school is a 90-90-90 it's a school which means that 9% of the students um, receive free or subsidized lunches from the government, which means the government pays for the, the lunch. 90% uh, of the students uh, come from ethnic backgrounds, so they're ethnic minorities. Um, but even so, 90% of the students um, excel in reading or other subjects. They meet the academic requirements. So even though these students, um, like I said, come from ethnic backgrounds or come from um, poor families, they still are able to um, meet their academic standards. So there's a lot of potential here, but it's just we just kind of get that out of them. So our main goal for visiting, to, visiting the school was to see what would be most help, helpful in terms of um, helping their lunch program the most. So that day that we went, they were serving for lunch four chicken nuggets, a corn muffin, the student's choice of chocolate, strawberry, or white milk, and an optional fruit. So we decided that it would be best if we could see how many students were choosing fruit, since that's clearly the most healthy part of the lunch. So we stood at the end of all the lunch lines, and we tallied that as all the students went by who chose fruit. And not surprisingly, only 31% of the student body took a fruit that day, which is a really low number. And um, we found, so 31% of the students took the fruit. And that's a really low number. And what was even worse about it is that they had packaged craisins, which are really high in sugar, and they were considering that fruit. Uh, yeah. So the this chart over here, the the kind of gray part is the total students for each of the three lunches, and the green part is the amount of students who chose to take a fruit or vegetable as a part of the meal. They could just take it like if the, when they were going through the line, they could just take an apple and take a, an orange. And only 30% of students even took an apple and orange. Never mind actually ate that apple orange. 
Um, and so what you can see the most is that in the first lunch, there's the lowest number because craisins weren't offered at that time. So kids really don't want to eat apples and oranges, but they will eat craisins, which aren't really nutritionally good. Better than nothing. <laughs> so um, coming out of uh, you know visiting the lunch program, one thing that we definitely got out was the fact that money is a huge problem. Um, when food was was definitely scarce to say the least in the in the cafeteria, um, the teachers were telling the students, um, and you could tell this wasn't any new news to them. They were telling them, um, you know, don't throw any food. If you have a corn an extra corn muffin, you know, save it. So they would go around and say, you're going to eat that? No. So they'd hold it up and say, who wants a corn muffin? And they'd say, 10 hands would go up, like, oh, I want more food. And they would say, oh, I, like, I saw your hand first. I'll give you the corn muffin. So like, these kids were hungry. They, they, the food that was being provided to them wasn't sufficient enough to like, the nutritional needs that they, um, that they needed. Um, even before lunch, we were talking to the vice principal. And uh, he told us exactly what he thought was going to happen during lunch. He was like, all right, guys, so it's chicken nuggets, a corn muffin, and fruit. I'm telling you now, every single chicken nugget will be eaten. Um, most of the kids aren't going to want to eat the corn muffin. And to be honest with you, I don't think I would have wanted to eat the corn muffin either. It's <laughs> very dry. But, um, and he said, very few people are going to choose to take a fruit or vegetable. And like we said, that was exactly what happened. Um, so this kind of told us that the, um, they knew that there was a problem nutritionally in the school lunches, but they just didn't know or didn't have the funds to be able to fix the problem. Um, so this kind of made a big goal of our project to not only fix the problem of this nutritional value in the school lunches, but to also make sure that it was cost effective for the school. So um, we decided to come up with the Healthy Lifestyle Education Program because most of their lunch program is government funded, which has a lot of rules about what can and cannot be served. So we couldn't directly change what they were being served, which was our original goal. So our alternative was this program, which is an interactive class that meets once a week to teach kids about food choices, portion control, creative exercise, and other healthy lifestyle decisions since they didn't really have a program like this at their school. And um, we decided that we would track the success of the program by measuring the students' BMIs each month. And that our original goal was to reduce the student obesity rate by about 5% and then hopefully to keep lowering it as the program continued. And um, it's a really great program because the only costs that are involved for the school would be to train the teachers and then to buy any classroom materials, which are both relatively low costs, and you're not going to have to train the teachers multiple times. Uh, so as you can kind of see, a majority of our project was kind of stemming from us actually visiting the school. And we were able to get information that we just would not be able to get just sitting behind a computer screen. Like, like I said, we had, that, we had that one main fact that 38.8% of the students that ate school lunches were obese, but that's pretty much, I mean, you can get numbers, you can get facts, but by actually going out into the community, speaking with the principals and getting, you know, hit, like real information about what's actually going on and what these kids are actually being served, what they're actually eating, it was just totally invaluable and, and it definitely, um, definitely was what able, what made our project to be so successful. Yeah, it was extremely eye-opening to be able to visit the school like that because everybody in our group had a much different background growing up than these kids. And it was just extremely valuable to be able to see that there's some kids who go to school every day and aren't sure if they're going to leave lunch hungry or not. And that was very upsetting to us, which is exactly why we decided to do this project. And um, I think we learned just as much from taking the course as we did from visiting the school. Any questions? Questions? Can we do that an hour later? I don't know. All right, thank you. One more. Oh, yeah. Um, did you talk to students? Um, they told us to not interact with the students that much, um, but some of the students did come up and ask us what we were doing, and they were um, telling us that they hated the food at their school, too, so that just reaffirmed exactly what we were doing. We asked if we could speak to the students, but so they, they just, I mean, just random four college students coming into your middle school. Um, we were probably lucky, lucky to get in there at all. Um, but they, that was one of the things they told us before, like try and like, keep your distance. But yeah, They hadn't had their quarry check, so yeah. they were Which supervised we were and told not to touch anybody. And yeah. We sent a thank you to the school, um, obviously, about, um, you know, like, thank you for letting us come in and stuff. And then we, we followed up with sending them our paper and kind of our plan, which had, like, basically everything, our whole project. And um, we didn't actually hear back from them. Um, so the, the project isn't put into place, but it's definitely something that we could follow up with, possibly, on an IQP. 
um, something like that, but it's not actually put into place. We gave them a step-by-step -step process of how they could accomplish implementing this plan, like meeting with school council and whatnot, so it also could be implemented in other schools if we ever wanted to take it to another level. Yeah, they weren't actually required to do even that much. You know, it's just, it was very academic, in, in, but we'll hear more about the interactive qualifying project where they actually have to be out there doing it. So, thank you. Thank you. Good job. So we've done a lot of assessment of the program since we initiated it, um, and I won't bore you with all of the numbers, but uh, this, the stu when we ask students at the end of the courses to evaluate how much progress they've come on the learning outcomes that are on that piece of paper, because of the class, um, they're all quite strong. Um, some a little stronger than others, and that varies from course to course, but that's okay. Um, other longer term assessment um, shows that the big, the big finding, are, you can sort of link these last three um, in terms of increased student confidence. Um, when you take first year students and ask them to do something that at the beginning they are like, I, I have no idea how I'm going to do this, and a semester later it's done and they've done well, um, that has a, has a major effect on their confidence and their ability to handle a lot of the things that are going to come up in the future um, for us, the subsequent projects. But even these two findings, I think, are really cool. And how cool is it that you take first year students and at the end of your course, they feel more comfortable talking to somebody in a position of power? I think that's one of the things I like best, one of the findings I like best. Um, it has been written up in the New York Times as a program that can increase retention in STEM um, because you've got students engaged in something that they find important and real and significant. Um, it also has been, the program has been recognized by the National Academy of Engineers as one of 29 real world engineering education programs and one of only two that were specific to first year students. So we really um, are very excited about the program and, and glad to continue it and hope that someday soon it might be the next new degree requirement for all WPI students. Um, so thank you very much, Alan. Um, I'm really glad there are so many people here um, to learn about this. I'm particularly um, impressed with WPI and the students. I hadn't met Tally and Jack before or seen their project. Um, and I'm continually impressed by how eloquent our students um, come to us, but also become through the process of this project-based program. Uh, so I'm going to talk about another requirement at WPI, uh, the interactive qualifying project, which it's we're very acronym heavy at WPI, so when I talk about it, I tend to talk about it more as a community engagement project. Um, and this seemed like a reasonable way to present it, the what, where, why, how and who. Um, so what? As Chris already said, it's a junior year requirement. So every junior at WPI must complete an interactive qualifying project. Uh, there's a few or two main different ways that that can be achieved. Um, I'm gonna, you could do it on campus, and if you're interested, after the presentation, I'm happy to elaborate on what that means, but uh, the gold standard really is to do it off campus, and now it's about actually 60% who complete their IQP off campus, uh, and that's what I'm gonna be focusing on in this discussion today. A uh, big component of these off-campus projects. Everybody has, every uh, student group, because they complete these projects in groups, has an external sponsor. Um, a sponsor doesn't mean a financial sponsor, though sometimes sponsors do actually um, give small amounts of money to project centers uh, so that they can continue to operate. Uh, but it really means that you have an organization, a not-for-profit, um, a state agency who is willing to work with the students on a consistent basis, um, help guide them in sort of the, their wish list for what they need, um, what the big issue they're facing is, and how they, they might hope it would get accomplished. Though um, typically, as Chris said, these are very open-ended. Two plus two doesn't always equal four. Um, so where, oops, back. Uh, we have about 35 project centers now globally. Uh, four domestic, um, Washington DC, Santa Fe, uh, what am I missing, Boston, and then I'm the director of the one in Worcester, the Worcester Community Project Center. Every project center uh, 
adheres to and, and uh, works to have their students accomplish certain learning outcomes. You can see them on your sheet, the IQP learning outcomes, uh, which were approved. Uh, they always existed. Um, but they got sort of formalized in 2006, 2002. Um, but every project center has their own identity. And it's largely created uh, by the needs of the community and by the faculty champion. Um, and so they have sort of different prioritizations of what they really hope the students come away with. Um, I'll talk a little bit more um, in a few slides about my biggest priority. Um, OK, so why? We talked about the learning outcomes. Um, because it's up there, and I just love to say it, and I'll say it again later. Um, my really big goal on top of uh, excellent communication skills with sponsors, with colleagues who you may disagree with, with diverse constituencies, with faculty, with people um, in positions of authority, with people who you may not like, um, being able to uh, communicate both um, in writing and uh, with presentations. Um, I have my students create videos as well. Um, and uh, conduct research, both uh, action-oriented community-based research as well as book research. Um, so all of those exist, no question. Um, and we have uh, one learning outcome that says they have to understand the ethical dimensions of a project. Uh, for me, I, I push and hopefully Bohr will attest that maybe it's true, that you have to understand not just um, what's going on in your community, um, which you can think of locally, you can think of globally, um, but also that you have the capability to do something and use your technical expertise for social change, but you also have the responsibility, which I love that Alan mentioned um, one of your learning outcomes was that um, social responsibility for civic engagement. And I love that word responsibility because um, we're all members of this world, right? And uh, so we shouldn't walk around as if we, we live sort of in a vacuum. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox now. Um, just probably momentarily, but. So how do we do it? Um, and again, this is just the gold standard sort of one, um, the off-campus IQP. We do it in two terms. Um, as Chris said, we operate on a quarter system. So there's four terms per year. Uh, and this is, I think, one of the hallmarks of why this program is so successful is the um, initial term is your prep term. We call it ID 2050. Um, <laughs> uh, so during this prep term, what's so important about it is you're learning the context. You're learning the background of the issue. You're uh, engaging in the intellectual academic conversation in the political conversation, in the policy conversation, um, in the grassroots conversation, in the societal conversation. Uh, and if you don't know all of the history and all of the context, when you get out into the field, uh, it's gonna be very difficult for you to one, be credible, um, and for you to get anything accomplished because you're just gonna be learning. Um, the second term is, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how in a couple of minutes, but the second term is when you actually complete your, your IQP project. And during this term, you work five days a week, um, though as Bohr will probably share, sometimes it's six, sometimes it's seven, um, 40 to 60 hours per week. Our students are extremely committed, uh, and not just because they're great. I think students anywhere, when you have the chance to really engage with an issue and with a community and see the need, you, you can't go home. Um, you just want to complete it and finish and do a good job. Uh, Another sort of how component that's one of the hallmarks um, is that the students do these projects in groups, typically of three or four. Five, we found, has gotten, gets a little too unwieldy. Two is um, not enough to share the workload. And you have two faculty advisors, typically, um, who work with you on the project. They may not necessarily be experts. Um, but they certainly can help you. They're experts in social science methodologies, and they can help you through the process, and they're with you the entire time, no matter where you're completing your project. And then a sponsor. So a sponsor um, is, um, I'll give you a list of some of the sponsors at the Worcester Community Project Center in a couple of slides, but typically it's a not-for-profit organization. 
um, at the Worcester Community Project Center, I always try to have at least two projects from the top down, working with state senators, um, mayor, city councilors, government agencies, and then at least three or four projects from the ground up, um, working with grassroots organizations. Uh, and the important part of that is that these students work in a cohort that's larger than just the group they complete their project with. So they're working with other students who are working with different organizations and they see the real value of both. Um, the need for government, government cannot function if it's not com continually um, put pressure on by the grassroots and I guess made to stay honest, um, though I think we're struggling in that area. See, I got back on my soapbox. Um, so the who, uh, of course it's the students, right? These juniors um, who are required to do a project, but there's also a faculty champion. And I say this is really important because um, to have somebody who gets to know a center, um, or more importantly, a community really well and gets to know the heartbeat of the community, and it's always, there's a, a big learning curve, right? You're always learning what's going on in the community. Um, but that can help the students get more integrated. It can also help you find the projects that are the most impactful, not just for the communities, right? Because the students probably gain more than they leave. Um, but for the students and the community. And then a community liaison is very important for um, uh, particularly our international project centers where it's difficult for some WPI faculty members to be in um, uh, South Africa year round. So you may need somebody there who helps get you connected. Okay, so now a little bit more detail on the how, how we do it. I mentioned already ID 2050 where you do all your research and you create um, a complete rep uh, proposal replete with a background chapter that gives um, the context of the issue that the students are going to be tackling. Uh, very importantly, all of these issues originate organically from the sponsoring organization. Um, I don't go to a sponsor and say, well, I've noticed that you guys don't recycle and we maybe could help you there. Um, one, that's condescending, but two, um, they know way more what we could possibly help them with than I ever would. Um, so they, they have to come um, from the sponsors, from the grassroots, um, or from state senators who are out there in the community all the time and might see something that's really important. Um, so they start with this background research, and then they also do um, a methodology chapter, which gives a real step-by-step -step, um, methodological proposal for how they hope to complete their project. And uh, during their prep term, that first term, they meet with their sponsor uh, once or twice just to talk with them about the issue a bit, make sure they're, they're sort of going down the right path. And, um, and then at the end, they give a big presentation to all of the sponsors, their cohort, anybody at the institution who's been really helpful. We have amazing research librarians. Um, we have a lot of institutional support for this. Um, and uh, they give this proposal over to their faculty advisors, absolutely, but to their sponsors who then can comment and say, all right, this isn't going to work. Um, or this is going to work really well, but we lost all our funding for that project. We've got to pick up the pieces now and move forward with something very different, which happens because um, it's the real world and it's messy. Um, also during the prep term, we have something called the, um, another fun acronym, pre-qualifying project, which also happens um, simultaneously with ID 2050, but in practice, it's the students meet in their group once a week with their faculty advisors. Uh, and this, this is really a brainstorming session. It's a troubleshooting session. The students have been placed in these teams um, with people who may not, uh, they may not get along with or may sometimes be issues that have to, there's frequently issues that have to be worked out. Uh, we again have institutional support for that. We have a student development and counseling center that does uh, great training on team dynamics. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we have the project term. Um, I imagine this happens at just about all the project centers, but I require all of the sponsors to um, have some sort of engagement portion of their, um, when the students work with them full time. So this is the term when the students are implementing their methodology uh, and trying to actually accomplish their proposed deliverables um, for their sponsor um, very collaboratively. But this engagement piece, um, 
<clears throat> I think this is essential because uh, students are um, always excited and they're ready to get out there and solve a problem. And our students are really smart and our students are really hardworking and they're very accomplished. Um, but it's, it's the eager beaver syndrome um, that happens to all of us, it happens to me. Um, and if you're not fully engaged in what's going on in your organization or your agency, um, you may miss something so crucial and you may be less engaged um, and less, um, less committed to the eventual outcome. So this engagement piece, uh, the way it sort of looks in practice, I have students working with Habitat for Humanity um, and uh, two terms ago, they ended up going on a build site with Habitat along with the people who were gonna be living in the house. They work at Habitat for Humanity's ReStore um, with the volunteers. Um, I won't talk about you, Broer, because you could talk about it yourself, but um, I have students who worked with AIDS Project Worcester and they would go with them whenever they would go and do um, testing. They obviously, they couldn't do the testing, but they would really understand the importance of AIDS Project Worcester and what it does for the community. And I hope, um, I believe that this engagement made them um, just this connection that couldn't be broken. And now I have so many students that continue to work with their sponsors. Um, there's no credit, uh, they just care. Uh, and that for me is one of my biggest learning outcomes that, that I hope to impress upon my students. Um, and I think I would say that all of us at WPI share that. So a little more detail specifically about the Worcester Community Project Center, just an example. <clears throat> um, and like I said, they all have sort of their own identity. Um, community empowerment and environmental responsibility is what I like to think of as the identity of the Worcester Community Project Center. So necessary components um, of an IQP, but frankly, really of any community engagement project. Um, background research talked about that. Um, social responsibility, I think I've talked about that. Um, collaboration. So again, this is um, going into a community and recognizing that the people who have been dealing with this issue for um, 20 years are going to be able to teach you so much. Um, and I guess learning humility. Um, so I really try to emphasize that all of these projects are collaborative efforts um, with the community, the sponsor, the organization that you're working with. And that's the way you have to approach it, approach it um, from the get-go. So talk to them about your, your methodological approach. See how they feel. See if they have suggestions or changes. And listen. Um, and our students do great at that. So here's some pictures of some. Um, this is a group of students. Uh, that worked with the Department of Environmental Protection and um, there's new stormwater regulations that have been uh, coming out since 2010. Um, <laughs> so though, though I have it on, on uh, good authority that they will be coming out next year. Um, but it's, they're pretty intense, these uh, new requirements of something called an MS4 permit. And they're very costly for a lot of the smaller um, municipalities in central Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So the DEP is really trying to act like an educational liaison with these municipalities and help them understand what these requirements are. Not just understand, but help them to uh, uh, complete them. Um, <clears throat> so one of the requirements is to map all of their catch basins and outfalls. So this is what you see these guys doing here is, is mapping. Certainly it's a service to the community that they're doing this mapping. Um, but they also are having a bit of a good time, so that's nice too. And they also see how hard it is. <laughs> um, sometimes these catch basins and outfalls, they have no idea where they are, so it could be, you know, within this quarter mile area, I think there is one. <laughs> so um, imagine how long that would take. Um, and here are some students who worked with an organization called the Regional Environmental Council. And you can see here, they're mapping out um, the four lowest income, highest percentage of um, minority residents and uh, against the four highest income, lowest percentage minority residents and looking at the concentration of environmental hazards in those locations. Um, for this organization who is looking to get uh, a grant from the Environmental Protection Agency to try and then address uh, some of those disproportionate burdens. Um, so they had tons of engagement too, but I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for for Brewer and questions. 
Uh, so here's the students working on the build site with Habitat for Humanity. And here's just a smattering of um, some of the sponsors that we've had at the Worcester Community Project Center. State senators, um, we've worked with Senator Michael Moore, Harriet Chandler, Jamie Eldridge, um, and amazingly, uh, one quick aside, anecdotal example, students who worked with Senator Jamie Eldridge on facilita facilitating the passage of an electronic waste recycling bill in Massachusetts. Um, and their eventual goal was to get widespread support um, in Worcester and at the high technology um, oriented school since technological generation we're going to be producing most of the um, electronic waste um, and at the end of the IQP the goal was that they would go before the Senate Committee on the Environment and report on what they thought would be the strongest component there was about five different bills before the committee at the time um, what they thought would be the strongest bill that should make it out um, to the Senate floor for a vote. And of course, Senator Eldridge, um, who I have a ton of respect for, uh, wanted his bill to be the one, but we told the students, you're independent researchers, you find the best components that you think would be the most effective. Um, largely from Senator Eldridge's, fr some from some of the other bills. And um, the very first week on IQP, the, um, the hearing was held. So the students came in, of course, you know, stone-faced and um, sweaty palms and butterflies in the stomach and all that. Uh, but they did it and they slammed it and um, uh, two of the bills made it to the Senate floor and it's going to be voted on this term. Um, two of the strongest bills made it to the Senate floor. So um, enormously proud. Uh, I'm like a mother hen, I feel like. But um, they did all the work and it was just a, a pretty incredible achievement, I think. Um, I want to show a quick video um, just of one project, students who worked with the Department of Environmental Protection, and where did it go? Here it is, okay. Um, to give you a, a, maybe a little bit of a better sense of some of the stuff that the students do, we'll just see most of it. Stormwater, water that comes from precipitation, looks like a natural flow of water, but there's more than meets the eye. Uh, in urbanized areas, water can't actually infiltrate the ground because of all the impervious surface. Instead, it has to flow over the ground, and in that process, it picks up anything that's on the ground there. It can be chemicals like automotive fluids or fertilizers. It can be um, trash like cigarette butts. Anything that's on the ground, it'll be picked up by the water and flow along with it. A good example, a well-known example, is the Charles River situation. Years of continuous pollution have left the river in a very poor state. It, the, the excessive pollution of phosphorus has resulted in huge algae blooms every year, and these algae blo blooms basically just choke the life out of the river. Um, it jeopardizes the recreational use, um, it damages the quality of life for the aquatic life in the river, um, and it just doesn't look very well for the river either. A Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, or MS4, is a system designed to transport and displace stormwater into surface water bodies. Stormwater enters the MS4 through a storm drain, formerly known as a catch basin, flows through underground pipes, and discharges from an outfall. The United States Environmental Protection Agency issues MS4 permits within Massachusetts. Our project was to help improve the stormwater management programs of Holden, Auburn, and Upton while helping them prepare for the upcoming Massachusetts MS4 permit, which is expected to be released within the next year. The state of New Hampshire has recently been issued an MS4 draft permit by the EPA. This was issued in February of 2013 and is believed to be a strong indicator of what the new upcoming Massachusetts permit will look like. All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, like I said, my name is Brewer. 
Um, I'm working with Worcester Earn a Bike, uh, which is a nonprofit organization in Worcester, Mass., on my IQP right now. So, just kind of the topics I want to touch on uh, during this, I'll keep it brief, um, is what makes project based curriculums different, um, what my IQP project is about, and then reflections on my IQP experience thus far, uh, being about two weeks into my project. So, Projects versus classes. Um, one thing when people ask me about, you know, what's it like at WPI, this is the biggest thing. Um, I would wager that probably 50% of my classes, academic classes, have had some sort of project component to them, um, which for me is awesome. Um, you could give me five different derivations for why something works, and I'm not going to believe you until I actually do it. Um, so projects uh, for me, I think, are awesome, and I think that's the same across the board at WPI. Um, and one great thing, particularly about uh, our junior year IQP, is since it's interdisciplinary, um, you get to explore projects that you might have never encountered or would have thought that you were going to encounter as an engineer. So I know, you know, coming to an engineering school, my thought was, okay, you know, I'm going to be an engineer, probably going to work in a lab the rest of my life, you know, probably won't ever work on something uh, like what I'm doing now. Um, so it gives you that chance to kind of expand your horizons and figure out, okay, you know, what does it actually mean to be uh, an engineer in today's society. And then finally, uh, it teaches you how to function in a professional environment. So, you know, how to engage with people, uh, like uh, Professor Wobie and Professor Denner said, in a professional environment. People in positions of power that, you know, you otherwise would maybe be, you know, uh, nervous to approach or you might not ever even think of approaching. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of what uh, I've gotten from my IQP thus far. So as Professor Denner mentioned, uh, you spend seven weeks for off-campus IQPs preparing uh, with ID2050. Um, so for my project specifically, uh, my group's been kind of fortunate. I mean, I don't want to say fortunate. But we, um, we have a project that's very engineering based. Um, we're building an adaptive bicycle for people with autism, Down syndrome, and cerebral palsy. Um, so you know, being engineers, we were all extremely excited to have a project that was engineering based, because that doesn't usually happen with IQP. Usually it's interdisciplinary, some sort of social problem. Um, so for us, um, Professor Denner was really pushing us hard to figure out, you know, why is this important? Because um, we really wanted to just start designing this bike, you know, we were all gung-ho, like, let's make this work. Um, but, you know, we had to take a step back and figure out, okay, why are we being approached with this project? Why does Worcester Earn a Bike want to do this? Um, how is it going to impact not only the Worcester community, but you know, other people across the country. Um, and it really caused us to dig deeper. Um, we were doing all of our background research to find all these organizations that actually cater specifically to what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so again, you know, during ID2050, you meet with your sponsor for the first time. And um, you know, our project took open-ended to the extreme. Um, we knew we were going to design a bike. Uh, and that was really all we knew. That was really all our sponsor had in mind. Uh, he saw this need for uh, you know, people with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities to have a bicycle that they could ride comfortably. And that was really where the project was left. Um, so you know, there's a number of different avenues we could take it. Um, we've talked about you know, fundraising plans since it was to earn a bike's nonprofit. We've talked about you know, how uh, we could come up with some sort of informational brochure. You know, so maybe if it was to earn a bike can't cater to a family's needs, where can they go for help? Um, so our project has really taken a lot of different directions over the past nine weeks that we've been working on it. Um, so it's been pretty exciting seeing it, you know, branch out into all these different areas. Um, and then finally, you develop your goals and objectives um, during ID2050, which again, ours were pretty, pretty expansive overall. So like I said, my project's creating an adaptive bicycle. Um, and I mentioned, you know, organizational support. So, uh, I have a brother with Down syndrome, so you know I had a little bit of an idea of you know how difficult it was to get bikes for people with developmental disabilities. Another member of our group um, has two disabled sisters, um, and then the other two have um, they've either worked with students you know in camps or you know um, one's uh, mom is a special ed teacher. So we've all have experience. So our group is really unique in the sense that we've all have experience working with people with disabilities and as well uh, we're all engineers so pretty cool the way our project worked out um, but you know that being said we didn't really understand the societal impact of it so when we got into researching our project you know we kept finding you know organization after organization 
who uh, was working with creating adaptive bicycles. And these are just a couple of them. So the Special Olympics has um, bike clubs, right? There's the Auburn Rockets, which are uh, the ones we're working with closely. Uh, we just spoke with their bicycle coach on Friday. Um, uh, Best Buddies, which is a national organization which hosts uh, four events throughout the year, um, mix of biking and you know like charitable walks. Uh, My Team Triumph, uh, which again another not-for-profit national organization, um, and then a couple others that aren't listed up there: Athletes Unlimited, which is Massachusetts specific, um, and then we've also gotten in touch with uh, local schools. Uh, so the Cotting School is one, um, the Boston College Campus School. So it was kind of eye-opening to see all these organizations that are kind of working on the same problem. And that's one of the huge benefits of the IQP that you wouldn't get in any other project situation. You know, like with the, uh, the Great Problem Seminar, I personally didn't take one because it wasn't required. Uh, but it's something that I do regret because, you know, hearing about their project and some of the projects that my friends did freshman year were pretty cool projects. Um, and, you know, it's, it's pretty unique. Um, you know, and then you, know, you go abroad for your IQP, and it's not like any other study abroad experience you're going to get at any other school. Um, so my colleagues over at Holy Cross within the RTC unit, you know, a couple of them have gone abroad. And it's basically, you know, you go to another country to learn in a classroom in another country. Um, WPA IQPs aren't like that. You go to another country to solve a community need in that country, which is going to be completely different and completely unrelated to anything you might have experienced in your hometown or in the Worcester community. Um, it's not classroom learning. You, know, you do work very closely with your sponsor. Um, my group uh, in particular, we were, again, a little strange. Um, our sponsoring organization uh, doesn't open until April 5th, um, but we've you know, been working with them on and off throughout the last nine weeks. Um, but you know, that being said, these last two weeks um, have been absolutely chock full of getting hold of all these organizations to try to gather all this information um, on you know, how we could go about building this bicycle, what resources are out there, um, so that you know, even if we don't um, come up with a one-size-fits-all solution to our sponsor's problem, we can leave them with a list of all these resources that they can reach out to, and then you know, of course these organizations can reach out to earn a bike and um, you know, kind of expand uh, the community's horizons a little way. So, it's, uh, like I said, it's a pretty, pretty unique opportunity. Um, so, kind of wanted to wrap up with, you know, does the project stand up to the hype? And in my opinion, it absolutely does. Um, I know WPI, when I was looking at it, uh, you know, when I was applying to schools, they really touted this project-based curriculum. And now right off the bat, it sounded awesome, and uh, it's living up to every one of those expectations. Um, like I said, classroom cannot compete with the real world. Uh, so like Professor Denner said, people's projects change all the time. Uh, some of our colleagues at the Worcester Community Project Center, uh, they've had their project change twice on them now. So <laughs> we've, uh, we've been pretty fortunate um, that our projects pretty much stayed the course. Um, but, you know, there's, there's always that wiggle room. Uh, we have a sponsor who's very open-ended to pretty much anything we want to do, which is good because it gives us, you know, some creative room. But at the same time, you know, Professor Denner uh, was helping us really, like, try to nail down what it is we want to accomplish because um, myself and my team, uh, we're just kind of throwing out idea after idea after idea. Um, so, you know, th they are really multifaceted problems and the things that, that, you know, give you an opportunity to solve something in your own unique way and to come up with a cool solution that maybe someone else might never have thought of. Um, and then, you know, finally, once in a lifetime experiences. Uh, even though I didn't go abroad, um, you know, I'd never heard of Worcester Earn a Bike. Um, I'd heard of the Restore uh, Habitat for Humanity, but you know, even having heard of some of these organizations, didn't understand the depth to which they dealt with these different societal problems. So, like the Department of Environmental Protection, um, when I saw that project listed, um, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm like, you know, there's no way I want to work with the DEP. You know, it doesn't sound fun, doesn't sound interesting, and we see them all the time at the project center, and their project's pretty cool, uh, what they're working on. So, you know, it it kind of enlightens you and makes you, you know, those things that you wouldn't think were cool or exciting turn out to be a lot more exciting and involving than, you know, anyone might have anticipated. Um, so, yes, I, I definitely think that there is a benefit to doing IQPs and MQPs and all these other crazy acronyms that WPI has come up with for projects. But, um, yeah, so if anyone has any questions, uh, thank you for your time and um, feel free.
Where yes. Is your project based? My project is based in Worcester um, at the Community Project Center. So WPI has an off-campus site um, where all the students in the Worcester Community Project Center um, can use as their office. Um, but most students work at their sponsoring organization if there's, you know, if that's what their project <coughs> entails. Yes. Yes. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the Project Center and uh, and how, as a student, you view it as being supportive of uh, project work? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the Worcester Community Project Center, um, you know, it's it's the conglomerate of all the groups that are working within the Worcester community. So there's students who are doing their off-campus project in Worcester. So for us, there's five groups. So five groups of four students, 20 students, all working with different organizations. And you know, the, I think the real advantage to having everybody in the same building but off campus, one, it isolates you from you know, classes and professors, so you're not even thinking about it. We're not taking classes right now. We're solely focused on our project. And then two, um, you, know, you, you get to hear about these other projects. Like I mentioned, the DEP project. That didn't sound interesting to me at all. And now, you know, I'm kind of thinking, like, wow, you know, that would have been a pretty cool project to work on. Um, we have a pretty, pretty cool office. Uh, each group has their own little office uh, where we can go to work. Uh, the advisors are there twice a week. Um, we meet with uh, our advisors once a week um, as a group or more if needed, um, you know, to kind of make sure your project's keeping on the same track. Uh, we have weekly meetings with our sponsors and our advisors. So, you know, the advisors can make sure what the sponsors are asking of us is realistic or in our case to kind of hold us back and be like, okay, you guys probably don't have enough time to do all that. So, um, yeah, I think it really, the biggest thing is it contributes to that community feeling and getting to know your fellow students better than, you know, if you were just working on any other, you know, short-term class project. Speakers?